So I want to welcome everybody this morning. Uh, this is our sixth in a series of the Winter Educational Series, and forward to, to being with Mark Sweeney and Brian Bailey this morning. Uh, just a couple housekeeping chores. Next Friday, we got Marty Jertson from Ping. Uh, Marty has a ball fitting system that Ping's developed along with, he's going to do some you know driver and wedge fittings. The following week, we have Andrew Moses. Uh, Andrew uh, works for a consulting firm, and he has a podcast and interviews uh, Olympic player, uh, Olympic participants, as well as professional sports personalities, and how they operate within the, the team concept and, and the, the people they rely on and, and how everybody kind of pulls together. And that's why he calls his podcast, Everybody Pulls the Tarp. And then coming going forward, we've got Sasha McKenzie and uh, Kevin Sprecker, who are going to talk about speed and using the ground and force plates. And then Sasha has a stack system that he has developed along with Marty Jertson, as a matter of fact, from Ping. And we'll probably try to get Marty on, on there as well. Uh, this morning, I'm, I'm happy to, to be on here with, with Mark and Brian. Uh, I, uh, I met Mark probably about 14, 15 years ago with the Aimpoint. Mark was the founder of Aimpoint. Uh, and to my knowledge, he is the, the only person in the golf industry who has ever won an Emmy which I think is like way cool, all right? And Brian uh, is a, a senior level four instructor with Aimpoint. He is a college coach in a previous life. Uh, Brian uh, lives in Charlottesville with his family and he does a lot of short game and putting. And then he does a lot of seminars uh, with college coaches around the country. And what Brian and Mark did here about five years ago, uh, they took Mark's ability to write software and create programs, and they created what they call Game Forge. And Game Forge is a system by which players can uh, use the Game Forge website, and we'll get into that in a few minutes here with Mark. Um, but they can they can input all their scores, and um, and Mark and Brian will explain to us how they do that. And uh, I've been looking at the website and uh, I have a subscription and what they've done to make it easier is you can input your scores within, you know, a couple of minutes. They, they set up a, a basically a punch list for every hole, whether you hit the fairway, whether you hit the green, how far the putt is and so forth. And so then what they do is they take this data and now they have, you know, probably over a million shots in their database. They work with everybody from juniors to tour players, both the LPGA uh, my friend Joe Howitt, who's very friendly with Mark and, and Brian, works with a number of tour players, among them Stacey Lewis, who's the Solheim Cup captain. And so Joe uses, you know, uh, the game forge with them. Uh, there's a number of tour players that Mark and Brian work with. And um, what I'd like to do now is invite Mark and Brian in here. And if you could, uh, gentlemen, tell us uh, how did you develop Game Forge? This was like five years ago that I understand that you put this together. What was the idea behind it? What was the concept? Well, I can tell you what my concept was, and it all it all came together when I gave a lesson uh, to a very high ranked junior player who um, said, "Well, I said, well, how are you putting?" She said, "Bad," and I said, "Okay, why?" She said, "Well, I hit 14 greens and shot 74, and my full swing coach says I need to putt better." And my answer was, "Maybe." Maybe not, but I don't know. Like, I don't know. I don't, I don't see your data. I don't track. Uh, I, I hadn't seen any stats from her. And I realized I didn't have the answer. I didn't know whether it was a putting problem or a full swing problem or a proximity problem. I had no information. And the full swing coach, of course, said, well, you know, you're hitting 14 greens. You must be hitting it well enough. Um, so it took some time to dig through her stats. And the, and the reality was she was hitting 14 greens, but her, you know, she was hitting everything to 35 feet. And so she was two putting everything, throwing it, throw in a one putt and a couple up and down she doesn't make and boom, she's shooting 74 on 14 greens. So it actually wasn't a putting problem necessarily, it was a proximity problem, but I had no way to understand that as a putting coach without having more information about the player's whole game. And so I realized I can't really understand how to develop a player well enough without understanding their whole game and understanding what they're doing when they're not with me. What do they do on course? What do they do in practice? Things like that. And so that was kind of the, the genesis for me of when Brian and I started doing this. Yeah. Brian, and, uh, Brian what was your involvement? Uh, I was uh, leaving my past life. Uh, I was after 17 years, I was hanging up college coaching. So, uh, you know, being a college coach, we had tons of different data systems we used. 
they're all really cool in what they do. But the problem was, is I had my players putting in 15, 20 minutes worth of data. And basically I would go look for one or two pieces. So they were putting in tons of data. I was taking snippets of information because most of the information I was getting back just wasn't usable. Like, how am I going to get my player better? So kind of as Mark and I were sitting around drinking a beer, eating a pizza, we said, hey, what can we do to, to make these, this stat work better for, for coaches? You know, what can we do to help players get better faster? And we were not impressed with a lot of the statistical programs. Hence, Forest Game Forge was born, and we've been running with it now for about six years. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting about Game Forge was that, um, and Brian and you and I had this conversation the other night, and you know, once again talking to you, a light bulb came on that most of us who are instructing golf are are developing skill yes. and not necessarily developing performance. I think that's and, the uh, yeah. I would say as an industry, we've we've not done the best job of taking skill into performance on the course. Um, you know performance is about what do I do like how do I do not how great my golf swing is now does a great golf swing help of course does a great motion help of course but there's a there's an understanding that you have to be able to perform you have to have a certain amount of offense so inside of game forge we break down golf really simple offense defense offense is making birdie defense is kind of preventing bogey and then we call noise is just crazy eagles doubles things like that so you've got to kind of understand that you've got to be able to build an offense and you got to be able to have a good defense if you want to be able to perform so kind of understanding what those components are give you the ability you know to perform and, and the beauty is it's you know the swing doesn't solve it the best putting motion on earth doesn't solve putting like you've got to hit certain benchmarks certain standards to reach certain score goals and before I did game forge honestly I didn't know what those standards were um so like you know so just the understanding now that i have a performance of what needs to hit to reach certain standards and scoring or different levels uh i'm a much better coach than i was five years ago six years ago when i was you know coaching teams that were fighting for national championships every week every year and that's because you have the statistical tracking that gives you the data that you need to coach properly exactly we can take a player from shooting in the hundreds say, hey, you want to start shooting in the mid-90s? This is what it looks like. You want to move into the 80s? This is where we've got to improve. Here's what's important. And then take that all the way down to the touring professional, too. If you want to be number one in the world, you've got to average two, two and a half under par. How are we going to do that? And again, it's, you know, the higher handicaps, it's much easier to make big gains and move quickly. As we start getting, you know, mid to low 70s, it's, it's a scalpel moving small pieces here or there to get them to reach their goals. But yeah, if you if you don't have certain standards, you know, you're not going to move. And that's what I've really learned. The biggest thing I've learned is there's not many pathways to get to 200 to be best in the world. You, you can't be the best putter on earth and do that and not be a good at this. Like to be these guys and gals on the professional tours, that that margin to be that good is very, very thin. And you don't have a lot of wiggle room. So you got to be good across the board. And and again, that's why, you know, you watch TV, you kind of laugh at the commentary because they're like, he's a terrible, no, he's not a terrible putter. Uh, you go look at his number, he's a really good putter. He's just a little bit less good than the best putter on earth, right? So so that that concept is, I think, is kind of what I've learned is be careful what you listen to. Okay. All right, so, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, people who are listening in this morning, as well as myself, you know, we we teach good players, right? We, we teach, you know, prospective college players or college players, you know, competitive juniors, uh, uh, country club members who are, you know, your best country club members are, are probably low handicap, you know, scratch one, two, three, and then all the way up to, to your 9,500 shooter, right? So you have every category covered and that's what you do in Game Forge, right? So you, you know that if I'm a 95 to 100 shooter, what do I have to do better, Mark? If I want to be the be the ninety shooter, right? So, so that's kind of what we what we started off with this um, with our benchmarking, just understanding of, at first the competitive golfers because most people that I teach are competitive golfers, and I think historically Brian has too. And so the question in the beginning was just okay, if you want to be a competitive golfer at college level, top ten in the country, tour average, tour winner, just what do you have to do? 
Um, and like Brian said, there's not a whole lot of different pathways as you get better and better. Like you have to, your ball striking and proximities and putting and scrambling all have to be at a certain level. And then we, then we roll that back to people shooting the eighties and nineties, the hundreds, um, and understand what that progression looks like. Um, I didn't understand it at all before I did this. And, and it, when you look back, it's not, it's not totally unintuitive, but it's also not the way a lot of people teach. Um, so what we found was, you know, in the beginning, basically people are just trying to get double out of the system, you know, trying to get the ball in the air and trying to get to the green faster. It's just, it's just really a game of, I need to get to the green and fewer shots. Um, everybody shooting 90 plus is averaging about the same number of putts. You know, they, you know, you should certainly help develop their putting, but that's not what this, that's not what's going to move the needle the fastest. What's going to move the needle the fastest is getting rid of penalties, getting them on the green faster, just straight up. Then there comes a point, and I'll show a graph in a second. And then there comes a point where the doubles are kind of out of the system and you have to start reducing bogeys, right? And that's more about proximity, scrambling, shorter putting. And then when you get to a high level of golf, you know, mid low 70s or lower, now you've got to start generating birdies. Birdies don't really show up until you're breaking 80, shooting in the 70s, where they really start to kick in. Um, and so, depending on the player who's in front of you, you have to have a, you know, you have to understand what are they doing. Because the other thing is sometimes somebody shooting 90 is hitting enough greens. Sometimes they're not even close to hitting enough greens. And you, and you have to, you know, I know as a coach, you're not out there watching your players play golf very often, right? Especially, especially the club members. You don't really know what they're doing on the golf course. You don't really know what their scoring is. Um, you know, even with tour players, you're rarely. If I out track, <clears throat> if I track with a, with a performance system, now I do, don't I? Yes. Yes. Unless you're tracking something, um, something at all, you really don't know, you know, um, you just don't like, they can tell you whatever, the, you know, when you ask somebody, what do they shoot? They say, well, my low score is 74. Okay. Well, okay. That's your low score. What's your, what's your average score? You know, well, how many greens you hit? I mean, I've had very high level competitive juniors. I say, how many greens you hit? They're like, I don't know. I don't really know. It's like, how do you not know that if you're a competitive junior golfer trying to go to play D one college? Like, it's just mind blowing to me. Right. Um, so, so, so what you work on changes as their scoring level changes. And, you know, if somebody's shooting nineties, it's really about getting the green and not making double and got to figure out, you got to know where those doubles are coming from. Is it penalties or is it what we call compounding errors? You know, you get multiple bad shots, miss the green and then duff your chip and then eventually two putt and you make double or triple. Um, you kind of have to have a good feeling on that and not just sit out there and, you know, watch them hit on the tee box. And what I think is really interesting about the system is that I know when I talk to my players about their rounds, right, though, they give me their perception of what they need to do better. Right. Yeah. And and typically everybody needs and I hear this all the time. I need to drive the ball better, which is which may or may not be true. Right. Right. Uh, I've got and it's funny you should talk about birdies because I've got players and, you know, shooting like mid 80s to mid 90s. And they say, I have to make more birdies. Now, what's yeah, the probability of that? Well, so here, so can you all see this chart here? Uh, I can. Thank you. Okay. So this, this basically shows you, it's very simple, but it's, but it gives you a very good idea of what's happening. So uh, a player shooting low sixties, all the way up to over a hundred, you know, what is their score comprised of? So if you take somebody shooting 92, um, you know, they're making five, four and a half doubles and eight bogeys and less than one birdie. Okay, so the doubles line is this is this red line, and right. you can see it's steepest between 100 and uh, 88, 89. So basically, until you're breaking 90, the change in doubles is what's affecting the score the most. That's the steepest slope there, right? Bogies are fairly uniform all the way down where you're reducing bogies, but in the beginning here, kind of 90 plus doubles is the big problem. Then you kick into you know bogies being the big thing because if you notice players aren't really making more than one birdie around until they're breaking 80. Interesting. On average, the, the, the birdie line here, the blue line is just pretty flat until you get to 80 uh, below 80 doesn't even hit uh, hits even pars about three birdies, three bogeys. So that's kind of our, a real standard benchmark. If you want to shoot even parts, the most common way to do it is um, three birdies, three bogeys, 12 greens, and then as you can see, the birdie line, when you hit seven, you hit low seventies or higher or lower, 
the birdie line just goes straight up because you just you know, there's just only so many bogeys you can get out of the system. And the only way to keep going lower is to generate more and more birdies. Right. So birdies is about approach proximities and putting. That is not what doubles is about. Right. It's a different, totally different part of the game. So this is okay. a very much a you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the numbers are the numbers. I mean, you can if you're shooting 95 and you want to make more birdies, you know, OK, but good luck. You know, <laughs> so, so our golf professionals who are sitting at clubs with members. Right. And they're they're assessing their games. You know, um, so Mr. Hobbins comes in and he's a 92 shooter. We know that he's making three to four doubles around. Most likely. Yeah. Yeah. On average. Yeah. And chances are I'm not making very many birdies. Right. Yeah. And, and he might be right saying I need to drive it better because, you know, a lot of doubles are originate from penalties off the tee box. Driving out of play. You know, not all, not all of them for sure, but that, that's certainly, that's certainly contributing a lot to it. Probably oh, half, half your doubles are that, I think roughly. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other half are, like I said, you're just getting to the green in par. So on a par four, you don't get to the green until your fourth shot and then you're two putting and making double. That's and the what other intrigues most me about the system and, and going through it is that it's very much a roadmap for performance. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the whole idea here is what we another thing we didn't understand is if you take a junior golfer and so your traditional stat systems are all um, strokes gained, right? These days, it's strokes gained pretty much everywhere you look. So take somebody who's a you know freshman in high school who's shooting mid to high 70s, let's just say, let's just say mid 70s. And you say, OK, you want to play D1 college golf and you want to be on tour in eight years. What do you have to do to get there? And the answer is, I don't know. You ask the player, they don't know. Well, I have to hit it better. Well, what does that mean? You know, that really doesn't mean anything. That's not a hard number you can work towards. Whereas what we say is, okay, you have to this many greens, this many have to be inside 20 feet. You have to scramble at this rate. You have to convert this many putts. Um, and that's, and that's your roadmap map. So let's start working on it. Um, whereas you don't, you can't really get that information very well at all out of traditional systems, even, even PJ tour, uh, even shot link, if you say, you know, I want to be a top 10 in the world player, it's not real obvious from looking at their mounds of data. It's not real obvious what to do to get there. You know, one of the things that, uh, that I've kind of watched over the last 30 years, if you will, is that in the early 90s, I was at Golf Digest schools. And in that era, you started to see technology kind of creep its way into the marketplace, you know month after month, you know, different systems would come out. And then by the mid to, and I used to say, you know, technology is going to take over teaching, right? Taking over instruction. And then by the mid to late nineties, it, it was there to stay. And then, and so for the past 20 years, ever since, you know, the turn of the century, it's been like, you know, the technology has gotten better. And as it's gotten better, it's getting, some of it's getting more affordable. And now this, to me is a another step forward in technology because what you've developed is you know a, a a system here on the internet that i can go into and then i can track by putting my scores in right so it's just another use of technology but this is more performance based which has not nothing to do with my skill level is that an accurate right. description no, I think that's exactly what we try to do is give you the information of what, where you are and where you need to go. What we kind of say next level, what does the next level for you look like? And we don't tell you how to do it. That's not our job. That's your job as a coach. Our job is to highlight strengths and weaknesses. This is what it looks like. Now let's get there. And, and I think the beauty of that, it holds a player accountable. It holds a coach accountable, holds everybody accountable by saying over this next six months, nine months, year, whatever this goal, or like Mark talked about, we have eight years to get on tour. What do we need to do over these eight years to reach these numbers that are going to give us a chance to be able to fight? And again, it's not about attack angle. It's not about face to pass. You know, that's a piece of ball striking better. But here are the performance numbers. How many shots are we hitting within 20 feet? What we call impositions, right? 90, roughly 90% of all birdies come inside of 20 feet. So we, we track one of the most important stats we track inside of golf is how, how often do we hit a green inside of 20 feet in regulation? So if you're only hitting four or five, and you're competing against someone that's hitting eight or nine, you know, over four rounds, that's 20 more opportunities they have to make birdie. So now you're saying opportunities, 
like what does that look like? So again, you've got to start understanding that there's a certain formula to be able to compete in this game. And for what you've got to do is say at my level, what are those numbers? And then what does my next level look like? So I can start goal setting there. And I think to me, uh, that graph that Mark showed you a couple minutes ago, that changed my entire coaching philosophy. You know, I, I used to think work green out. I'm a putting coach. I'm a you know short game coach. I love everyone saying, let's work around the green. But that, again, for the higher handicap, that's the worst bang for their buck. The best thing you can do is get them on the tee box, get them to be able to control something off the tee that's long enough so they can play golf and then start hitting greens. You know, you know, for my son, when we, we started learning, it was, can we get to green? Can we get to the green and par value? And then can we get to the green par value minus one? Now, can we get to the green and par value minus two, which is regulation? So we just set goals every time we teed it up. It's like, how fast can we get to the green? You know, and that's getting rid of that double line. Now that he's gotten rid of the double line, we're moving over to the bogey line. What does that look like? Well, now we've got to start putting better because he three putts way too much, which is really bad for a dad as a putting coach, right? <laughs> he, put, he three putts way too I play with him. I see it every day. He three putts way too much. So we've started working on removing bogey. So we're, we're focusing right now, and it helps that it's winter, is we're just doing tons of putting work as long as continuing what we're benchmarking full game. By benchmarking, we're saying we, we're hitting the numbers we want to hit, and we want to keep training to maintain those numbers. Uh, of course, we're trying to get better, but we're really kind of putting in a let's let's keep them where they're at. Let's keep doing. Let's not add anything. Let's not break anything. Let's do what we're doing. Let's add putting now. So we're going to add this component in and keep the ball striking where it's at. And then we're going to add short game. So it's it's just that understanding where they are in that graph, understanding what the numbers are. It makes coaching so much easier. And, and again, the beauty of it, uh, as everyone's sitting in this meeting, you might have a T sheet for your practice today. You might have a college player coming to see you. You might have a mini tour player. Then you might have Mrs. Havercam shooting 100. And then you might have Bill that shoots, you know, 84. What you're teaching each individual student is completely different. And if you don't have some sort of criteria, understanding of performance, what are you really teaching them other than maybe a skill acquisition, which you do need skills and you need to acquire that. But when you look at performance, you need to be able to say, what can I do to help my player best today to move them to where they need to go? And I how think fast, how fast can I do that? Right. And you'll be amazed on how fast you can move people once you know the numbers and where you really know to kind of hit where to hit and to get them better. Instead of, you know, I think in golf, we're, we're beauty at chasing rabbit holes, right? We go in a rabbit hole, we go all the way down it. I thought with putting, I would solve putting in a year. It's been 15, 16. I still haven't solved it, but you know, so a player comes to me because they need to be better at putting kind of like Mark said, but maybe that's, maybe I'll make them 2% better in the next month because they put so well. So I'm, I'm marginal, but if they would hit three more greens and pick up one more in position, that could change their scoring average by a shot where I'm only going to change them maybe 0.2. So again, it's just understanding strengths and weaknesses and where you need to focus and kind of that's how we talk in the system. Everything is about a focus point and a benchmark. Benchmark is we're happy with where we're at. We're hitting our criteria. Let's try to move past that. But focus areas would be failure, you know, like areas of that we're underperforming. What can we do to address that focus area and start to move it? Yeah. So if I would, I mean, there's no other system I've seen that, and I've seen pretty much all of them uh, through college coaching. I haven't seen a system that actually helps the coach and the player come up with really good decisions on how to get better. Gives the answer opposed to, you know, speaking generalities. Well, one of the issues that I have with what you're doing, which is my problem, not your problem, is that. I know, I know you're going to love this, right? Yeah, you're right and I'm wrong. Um, when I go, I know it had to happen sooner or later, right? But when I go through your data and I look at it and I, I look at these different benchmarks and then your game forge index, which is, is, is part of your system. I realize that I, I'm giving, I'm not helping people perform better. I'm helping them develop a better skill right? But I'm not lowering their score because I'm going after the wrong thing at the wrong time. And that's, yeah, that's, a, that's a really, that's an awakening for, for most of us to, to realize that. Well, the thing you've got, you know, the, here's the thing where coaches are, we're getting paid to change a player's score, right? They come to yeah. you because they want a different score than they have now. That's Unless they're just 100%. coming to talk, which you're, which you can do also. Um, but you know, if you can't show a player that you're improving their scores over time, you failed or they failed, or you both failed, but, but there's, you're not getting anywhere. And if you're teaching competitive golfers and their scores aren't trending in the correct direction, 
your lifespan is going to be very short with that player. Um, like Brian said, accountability, the players, when you track it correctly, the coach is accountable, the player's accountable. You can't hide from it. You can't say, well, I'll just kind of keep doing this and we'll kind of keep working at that. No, you know, I have players who want to play LPJ in two years. I'm saying you must perform at this level. And we're tracking their trend to say, are you heading that direction or not? And if you're not, we've got to figure out why quickly, you know, because one thing we see all the time is college players, good college players, top 10 college players graduate, can't make a dollar on tour, totally unprepared for what their performance level has to be at the next level from college. And it's a big wake up call for them. Whereas we're telling them way in advance, this is where you need to be. You better start working on it now and not after you graduate and suddenly go out and get your butt kicked for two years and quit golf. Cause I've seen well, that happen a lot of times too. One of the things that, you know, when Brian and I were discussing this the other day was, you know, he, we're talking about his son who, you know, a lot of us are teaching kids and, um, and he's telling me what he's doing. And I said, well, how's this putting? And he says, putting's horrible. And I'm thinking, well, you know, here we got one of the best aim point coaches in the world. He's a short game specialist. Why is this putting so bad? So I said, why is this putting so bad? And he said, because I, I have not addressed it yet. I, I didn't care about his putting right now that, you know, that was, you know, that's not the low hanging fruit, getting him from, you know, shooting a hundred to shooting 90. I have to get him to the green sooner. I'm not going to waste my time on, on his, his short game and his putting right now. He spends too many shots between the tee and the green. And I thought, well, that, that's just a whole different way of going about this because a lot of these systems, you know, like what's it project 36 or operation 36, you know, works for the green out. And what Brian's doing is he's working from the, from the T to the green. He's just the opposite of, of some of these, you know, would appear to be very successful programs out there. Yeah. I, I think a lot of it, again, it, I, again, I thought working green out made sense, right? Cause it's a smaller club, easy to understand, but it doesn't totally. move the needle. Um, I think you know, it's made a, sense for 50 years. A player that shoots in the 90s averages 37, 38 putts, 100, right around there. And a touring pro that shoots, you know, averages one, one and a half under is about 29 putts. So there's maybe 10 putts there, right? The average high handicap 100 player is hitting 60 to 70 shots to the green. And the tour player is averaging 30, some upper 30s. 37, So there's, right? you know, there's 40 shots, anywhere from 30 to 45 shots difference. So I can improve 10 or I can improve 45. Where, 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 where's the best time for me to actually pull this stuff back? And again, it really comes back to ball striking. So all the full guy, all full swing guys are going to love this. Ball swing, ball, like stroke, stroke, swing, 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 until we start getting – in the 80s, now we got to start adding in other pieces. So again, that's just what the data shows us. It's it's can can I get it off the tee, hit it far enough? Am I playing the correct tees? Can I hit it far enough to compete? And then from that, how many greens can I hit? And then as I progress, now it's how close can I hit the when I hit a green, how close do I hit it? And then what are those conversion rates? And then that's kind of the progression of offense, right? Offense is really simple. Offense, if you want to make birdie, got to hit a bunch of greens. From the greens, you got to hit proximity close to the hole. How many hit within 20 feet? And then what is your conversion rate? And we give you all this inside of Game Forge, and you can show what a tour player does to a hundred shooter. This is what these are the target goals. This is what they should be doing. And if they're not doing it, let's let's address it. When I say my son's a bad putter, yes, he he's averaging probably about 38, 39 putts. So he's doing kind of what he's supposed to. That's why I'm not really concerned. Now he's putting 49 times every round out we would address his putting more, but he's not, he's kind of hitting his target goal. So again, we're not worrying about that. We're going, Hey, where we get the most bang for the buck is, can we, can we get the ball off the tee better? And that was his big, big faux pas. All right. But you've penalty. done that now. Now he's oh, we've like done that. He's getting gone into the low nineties. Yeah. He's gone from hitting one green basically around now to hitting about five and a half to six every time we tee it up. So he's so now, now, getting now you need to find him a good short game coach. I do. I, I know a couple. I'm going to start calling them. So, uh, uh, but, it, but so yeah, he's gone from having no chance to break a hundred now to actually he's ball striking is actually like a low 80 player. He's averaging right around 90. So that's why like I said in the winter, we, we've made this change. Now we're going into putting and after putting, we'll, we'll pick up more and more short game um, again, because that's, that's what his game calls for right now. So, you know, the, the beauty of the system, and I think this is where this is just a lot of fun is, we break down every individual play. We show strengths and weaknesses. The coach can sit down and have a very meaningful conversation with juniors, 
parents, player, where are our goals? Where do you want to be? Here's what it looks like. Let's get there. It, well, here's the thing the is, if, if I, as a player, if I put my stats in and, and as you're my coach and we go over them, I can't deny the facts. There's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere to hide, right? right? Yeah, Unless I mean, for bad you data. or for me. Let's right. put a bad data other than that. A lot of, you know, some coaches don't like that. Some coaches are very, very uncomfortable with opening the kimono and saying, hey, you haven't gotten any better in the last six months. Like, what's going on? Uh, or worse yet, you've gotten worse. And we certainly see some situations like that where we see, uh, if you watch a player's trend, sometimes you see the line kind of do a step function, uh, good or bad. Like, we've seen some really good ones and we've seen some really bad ones too. Um, and you need to catch those when they happen as a coach. Cause if somebody, you know, I have a, I have a player went to college and uh, putting was really, really good went to college and boom, it just dropped. It's like, okay, well, what's going on? Well, totally different practice routines than we usually do. Okay. Well, we got we have a problem because you're putting to grades every time you go back to school in the fall. So um, I know, you know, you have to do certain things and your coach makes you do certain things, but it get, every time you go back in the fall, your putting gets worse immediately. Um, and if you don't have visibility that you'll never know as a coach, you'll never have any idea. Um, conversely, if we talk like at the tour level, so there was a, a tour, a PJ tour player we started working with maybe three years ago, um, who was a good putter, um, only had, I think five to five and a half, uh, in positions around. So, uh, birdie putts inside 20 feet had five, five and a half around barely survivable on tour at that number, like probably not survivable. You really need. So what you're saying is if I'm going to play tour golf on the PGA tour and I have five opportunities for birdie inside 20 feet, I'm on the fringes. You're not going to be there next year. You're not going to survive at five, five and a half. He he barely, he was barely getting by because he was a very good putter. Um, but it wasn't enough. So we sat down, had a, had a lot of n- number of conversations with his coach and just said, you need to find two more birdie chances around. Just start there. You just need two more around. Where are they coming from? Is it a, is it a, a dispersion problem? Is it a yardage problem? Is it a targeting problem? Are you being too conservative with your targeting? Um, are you, do you have loose shots? And it wasn't loose shots. It was more of a, I must hit seven birdie opportunities around minimum. Must, you have to. So then you back up your game from there and say, okay, well, where do I get those? What clubs do I have in? Where, what are my, um, what, what is my targeting? If I go to the middle of the green with a mid iron, you're screwing yourself, right? Mid iron in, short to mid iron in, uh, you know, tour players should be taking a lot more dead aim at the hole if they want to be inside 20 feet. Um, if you're just trying to get on the green, fine, go to the middle. Of the, if you're just trying to get on the green and you're shooting mid high 70s, fine. You want to hit the middle of the green, fine, but you're not going to have your seven plus in positions. So they spent a lot of time figuring that out. And now he's a top 10, I think he's top inside top 20 FedEx cup last year, inside top 10 this year. Um, but that, and that didn't happen overnight, but that I was know a, who you're talking about. Number. And I checked his just, you know, since you were coming on this morning, I checked him this morning and he is, he is inside top seven. Yeah. And, and, and again, it didn't happen overnight, but the, the first you have to start with, why am I not scoring better? Okay, well, you need two more opportunities, period. End of story. Non-negotiable. Go figure that it out with seems your coach. Like, that seems relatively simple, even at the tour level, right? Yeah, but you know what the difference is between, you know, tour average scoring and top 10 in the world? It's one shot around. It's just one shot. That's so it. now when you say in positions, you're talking about approach shots that are within 20 feet of the hole for birdie opportunities. Yeah. All right. And so uh, what I did last night is I went through some of the scoring from Phoenix yesterday and the I think seven under is leading at the end of the day and the the gentleman who was seven under he had nine in positions yesterday yep and another player who you know we've discussed in the past who has uh who has some difficulties and actually you know lives in Orlando near you he had uh he was a couple over and he had, I think it was four in positions yesterday. So it's amazing. Yeah. When, Winner, when, winners have, winners have about between it. Uh, winners have about nine. That's, that's a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Well, if you're hitting 12 greens and nine or, or if you're in 13 greens on tour, nine have to be inside 20 feet. 
you got you gotta you gotta hit it pretty well. <laughs> and no, you gotta you get good targets. You, you know, have to you do. good targets. What, what, what I think is interesting here with that I'd like you to share with us. So uh, I want you to predict the winning score this week in Phoenix based on what you and Brian have done in the data you've collected for the last five years. Right. So so that was that was somewhere we started in the very beginning. We just said if you want to win at different levels of golf, like what what is the, what is that score? Let's just start at the score. Um, PJ Tour on average, the winning score is 16 shots below the cut line. So you take the cut line and you take 16 off of that. And that's usually the minimum winning score. So usually two or three guys get there. Uh, and whoever goes deepest wins. Uh, so majors are a little today, less. The cut line today was probably going to be minus one to two. Yeah. So if the cut's minus two, you, as a player, you've got to get to at least 18 under to have any chance. Um, okay. LPJ, it's 18 shots under the cut. So take the cut in an LPJ tournament, take off 18 shots. Uh, and that's your typical winning score. So, so now you're saying, okay, well, let's say the typical cut is uh, even par. I've got to get 16 under to win. And then you can back in that. Well, how many birdies and bogeys is that? If I make one bogey around, that means I need to make 20 birdies. At least exactly. 20. We're talking 20. We're talking closer to 24 birdies in a tournament, uh, which is six birdies a day off 13 greens, 13, 14 greens. Okay, mm -hmm. so you need a strategy that generates six birdies a day off 13 greens, which means you better hit it close and you better make a lot of putts. At the tour level. At the tour level. At the tour level, right? Now, now what's interesting is um, I got some video last night from one of my students who is in Florida playing, right? And I, you know, I went through the video and, and early this morning I got up and I sent him a text about you know what I saw and you know how much better it's looking and everything. And here's the here's the what I got back from him. Swing <laughs> has been really good, consistently going out there and hitting great shots, driving the ball well. Now this was a guy who was a hundred shooter when I got him, right? He said, I'm still not breaking 90. I go out there, I par a number of holes, which I've never done before. I bogey a few more, and then I have my blow-ups with doubles and triples that ruin my round. That's, that's, that's your game the profile, board. right? Yeah. So, you, so you've got to say, what are the what what is the source of the double and triples? Is it penalties off the tee, or is it again compounding errors? If you ever watch somebody who just learns to play golf, what do they do? They bunt it down the fairway, four or five shots, and then two putt, but they just can't get the ball in the air. They just can't control the ball. Right, right. But I, I just I think that's really interesting that you know there's there's your typical 95 shooter right he's breaking 100 now which was one of our goals right anybody shoots over 100 you want him to break 100 and now our next goal is uh, obviously to get him into the from breaking 100 into to me you know 94 95 96 range and then my next goal was another four or five shots so now he's to the point now where if i can eliminate his doubles and triples and what's causing those then i can go to the next level like brian was talking about with his son so Again, basically, just gives you we that get back to what's that's, important. Yeah, that's the roadmap, right? Yeah, and, and I think what we've done is, and we call it the forging player series inside of Game Forge. It's we say a learning player is anybody that shoots in the hundreds. Um, an emerging player is kind of breaking into the nineties. So you're you're wanting to take him to an emerging player. So what's really the most important? So inside of that, we're actually adding primary stats to that, which is saying here are the most important stats for that. Then we have developing proficient which is kind of getting you through the eighties. And we say, we have quick stats for that, that these, this is what's important for you to understand now. And then once you get inside of the advanced player, basically shooting the seventies, we move you over to full stats. So we have a stat system that kind of grows with you. Cause we, you know, if you're a, a hundred shooter, we, you, we don't need that much data on you. We don't need 20 minutes of data input to figure out what's happening, right? We, we break it down saying, here's what's important now. And here's kind of the gradual movement from, from piece to piece. So again, like I said, it, it's just, it just, as a coach and as a player, it just defines what's, what's important now for scoring. And then what does that next level look like? And for that player, he, he nailed it, right? So again, birdies is not going to be a big priority for him. He's like, I don't make enough birdies. Well, you're not until you shoot 80. So birdies again is, so we're not going to talk a lot of offense. We're going to talk more generally, hit more greens, which is going to help us remove bogey probably. And if we hit more greens, that means we're probably hitting it better off the tee, which is giving us a better chance um, to take away big numbers. So again, it's just saying, what chess pieces do I need to move? 
to get this player to reach certain goals. And I think a lot of it is as a player, I want to make birdies, right? Birdies are cool, but I just don't have the skill set or, or the performance to be able to enough skill pieces to perform. So I need to start addressing that and start building what I need to create. To, yeah, birdies aren't even something a 90 player needs to consider. No, I don't really you know. know. No, I've been playing a lot of golf finally with my son. Thank God. So I get to play golf a bunch now, and I'm I'm about a two handicap, three handicap. I make about two and a, two birdies per round. That's what I do. I make you know roughly three to four bogeys. Kind of that's what I do every day, and it's just who I am. So me, as a, what do, if I'm coaching myself? What do I need to do? Well, one is I got I got to remove a bogey, but I got to find at least one more birdie. You know, I'm hitting because enough. You're a low seventy shooter. Yeah, I'm hitting enough greens to shoot par better. I'm right now it's just I got to hit proximity wise get a little closer make a little bit better putt so so for me as a coach I can diagnose what I need to do now am I going to go train oh god no (laughs) I just play (laughs) that's fair I'm I'm the bad player that you get a hold of I'm not I'm not gonna work on that (laughs) you're the bad student right but I know my numbers okay so um in game four you've created your own vocabulary your own nomenclature you want to share yes. some of the stuff that you do there with us? You want me to take that, Mark? Or you want that one? Well, well, the background to that is, you know, as coaches, we kind of started from scratch and said, what do I need to know to help my player? Like, what's the information I need as a coach? And we found that there, we didn't have all the information we need. Like, greens and regulations is important, but it's not enough information. We need to know how many greens are inside 20 feet because that's where your, your birdies come from, right? Because if I go out and I hit 18 greens at 30 feet and I had 36 putts, I'm a good putter. Yeah, you're actually a very good putter. But as a coach, I don't know that. Sorry. Right. So, so we break down our, our greens into what we call proximity rings, which is how many inside 40, how many inside 20, how many inside eight. Um, so, so we can have a better idea of the density of your shots when you're hitting the green, how many are real, how many are great birdie chances, how many are good birdie chances and how many you're just supposed to two putt from and get out of there. Um, right. So anything outside of 20 is a two putt. Generally. I mean, I mean, you'll make one and you'll make 5% outside 20 feet about, but, but it's, but you're just outside 20 feet. You really just want to be even. You just want to have the same number of three putts and one putts. If you're even out there, you're playing, you're putting great. Um, but it's really the 20 in and in, which are the offensive numbers we need, especially with competitive golfers. Um, so, so we just, we just said, what, what's the information we need? If there's not a current stat in golf for it, then let's just make one up, which is what we're really good at. Right. <laughs> yeah. We're really good at that. And I was in poker. I was in poker mode. I was playing a lot of poker during this. So a lot of our names have tie-ins to poker at the time because a I lot of those percentages break down to what we were talking about. Well, blackjack's my favorite tables game. Yeah. yeah. And so you have a blackjack. What's a blackjack? Blackjack is when you hit a green in regulation inside of eight feet. So right. that's kind of your kick in birdie zone. Um, that's your best birdie opportunity. That's your best bet. So kind of if you understand the PGA numbers at eight feet, 50% roughly, well, is, you know, roughly around eight feet is kind of your 50% margin. It, it boggles a little bit each side. But that, so we said, hey, this is inside of eight feet is when the odds are in your favor. You should be making a high percentage of birdie. So kind of another stat we track inside of Game Forge is par five scoring. So what we've come to learn is where do you get the majority of your blackjacks from? It's not from hitting from 160 yards. It's from hitting it inside of 50 yards. So those are your go for it greens, you know, short par fours, par fives. So we track go for it on par fives. That's an important stat to be able to how close can I hit it? So that's where your blackjacks come from. A really cool dispersion thing is, is dispersion at 40 yards, the average dispersion on tour is 6%-ish, is roughly gives you that eight foot. So an average shot from 40 yards gives you eight feet. So again, that's why the majority of your shots from blackjacks come from par fives. So again, for if you're a coach and you're having players lay up, you might want to learn more about game forge and change that, that, that teaching because again, the, the ability to go forward is the, how do you, Again, the question is, how do I make birdie? Where do I get offense from? Disproportionately, it's par five scoring. So one, of again, the things we, that, one of the things I thought was really interesting with that was that you developed a putting chart from three feet to 30 feet in Game Forge. And so if I'm a, an 84 to 88 shooter, you could tell me at three, four, five, six, all the way up to 30 feet, what my percentage of make is going to be. Mm-hmm. And that all comes from the the over a million shots of data you've collected? 
Yeah, just from all the all the players that we had in the system. And I think as a coach, foot by foot is cool. But on the other side of the chart, we gave you we gave you distance spins. We said between one and six feet, kind of par saves, your percentage should be this. Right. Between one and eight feet for birdie, your percentage should be this. Your right. You call those your bins. percentage from nine to twenty feet. So we break it into bins because one thing I know is players are really bad at distances. If you told them to get it four feet, some would they be at four, four feet, feet, some would be at three, some would be at eight. Like they right. don't understand it. So if you put them in distance bins and move them around, and it's kind of mirroring what golf is, this is what you should be performing. So to kind of give you a, a highlight, you know, I'll ask this question, and it, you can put it. I'll let it sit for a minute. Uh, you can put it in the, the chat box from nine to 20 feet, non game forge members only can answer this from nine to 20 feet on tour. What do they average? So if they had 10 putts between nine and 20 feet for birdie, how many are they going to make? How See many are going to make on the if PGA anyone tour? dares to put their uh, answer on what they think that is. And then, but, but it's, it's definitely, it's but that's, what you have to train it for. but that's what they need to train for. And there's a big gap between there and college. Very much so. The big gap in that make range between co good college players and tour player average. Like that, that like, like offense, we, right? Yeah. I mean, we find the biggest, the biggest gap between college and pro golf is short game and putting. It's not ball striking. That's, that's the anchor. Uh, that's the phone call I probably have with more college players and college coaches is how can I get my players to be better? Ball striking collegiately tends to mirror professionally. Now setups are different. Yardages are different, you know course all that's different but they tend to get the same amount of greens the same amount of in positions the big difference is that the professional is as converting at a different rate and i'm not going to say what that is yet <laughs> yeah what's interesting to me is the difference like you know in uh in those you know handicap like the 84 to 88 player you know at six feet they're going to make according to your chart like you know less than half of their putts yeah, and, and you'll also notice tour players are making twice as many putts at almost all ranges yeah. than somebody yes. who's shooting mid-80s. I mean, literally, they're, they're making twice as many putts. Yeah, the, the, uh, one of the things I thought was cool was like at eight feet, the tour player is making half of their putts. And what does an 85 shooter make? Uh, at eight feet, 28%. About half, yeah. No. About half yeah. of what a tour player does, yeah. So, uh, so obviously that inside ten feet for the developing and proficient players is now now putting matters. Or not? Well, those are your par saves, yeah. right? I mean, those are that's. I mean, the majority of all their par saves are inside twelve feet. And so you would say with the higher handicap players, you just want to get them somewhat proficient at rolling the ball. But it, you know, you're not developing the skill set like Brian got his son to roll the ball, but you know, not too honed in on the skill set yet. But now well, that he's a 90 shooter, now they're now they're starting to 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 work more on skill set of putting. I I think it's all right to make sure their fundamental motion is good so that they're not so that three years later you're not going, oh man, we need to unwind this really horrible motion. But you're not you're not you're not dinging them on how many putts they're making yet. You know what I mean? Like you can develop some skills, but, but you're not focusing on that to change the score. Right. Yeah. My, at that level, it's my ball striking. Yeah. yeah. I don't and, like and it to the green definitely. sooner. And, and kind of when we're talking putting inside of six feet, why is that so important? Uh, well, we've come to kind of going back to terminologies and, and making up a language. We, we do something called P sixes and P 12. So that's saying, when you miss the green in regulation, you're, you're on a par four, your third shot, usually chipping, hopefully somewhere around the green. How often do I hit it within six feet or 12 foot diameter of the hole? So um, well, I think a big fallacy that people have is everyone says, well, you should average chipping it within three feet because roughly 98% of the tour converts at 98, 99%. You're always going to save par. Well, the problem with that is um, on the PGA tour, there's only two lie conditions and it's from zero to 10 yards from fringe and fairway that they average inside of three feet. Everything is outside of three feet. So if you're, you're expecting your players, especially maybe 80s or 90s players, to hit it within three feet, it doesn't happen. So what we've done is we said, all right, here's a P6. It's a 12-foot, you know, six-foot radius, 12-foot diameter around the hole, or P12, which is actually a 24-foot radius around the hole or a diameter around the hole. And you can put them in different lie conditions and kind of assess what they do. 
you know, hit 10 shots. And then what we've really found inside of Game Forge, which is phenomenal, is pretty much until you're kind of at the 75 shooter, whatever your P6 value is, how often you hit it within six feet is your scrambling rate. Those two kind of mirror each other. They kind of hang out. So the only way your player makes par is their ability to hit it to within six feet. When they miss inside of six feet, again, because the putting is not good enough, uh, they don't separate scrambling from the P6 value. So inside of coaching, a great coaching tool is if my player needs to work on performance around the green, start doing P6 drills. How often can I hit it within six feet or, you know, six foot radius of the hole? Or if they're not good enough there, here's a P12 drill. How often can we get within 12 feet? And then that, that again, those stats and their ability to do that you can actually change their game because I think a lot of players are too, too defined, too tight of an area, or a lot, I hate to say it, most players just don't know. They just don't care. They don't know how to train it. Right. They only want to watch it on TV. It I see a lot of, you know, I see a lot of six, eight feet with the men and the ladies. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're, they're tough little shots or they short side themselves. Well, you got to realize most scrambling is not from the collar. Most scrambling is 20 to 30 yards from the rough or bunkers. Right. Throw your throw your players 30 yards out in the rough and say hit it six feet. Do it yourself. Good luck. Good yeah. freaking luck. You know what I mean? Now tour players do it very well, but you know, people will sit there and they chip around the green. Well, that's not scrambling. I just right. tell you that, that that's not scrambling. Scrambling is 20 yards out in in a in fairway rough sand. Yep. But again, according to what you're seeing with Game Forge statistics. That that putting and short game development becomes more necessary as I become the low 80s, high 70s shooter. Uh, well, breaking breaking 90 for sure. It starts to kick in a little bit by the time you're in the 80s. It'll start to kick in. Right, you have some skill set there, but you know. But then as as you progress down into the low 80s, high 70s, now you're trying to eliminate a few more bogeys and give yourself a few more birdie opportunities. If you yeah, want but to it's fractional. I mean, it's right. fractional. Like. I mean, literally from a tour average to a top 30 player, it's like a half a shot around. So, so you might get a 10th in one spot and two tenths somewhere else and two tenths somewhere else. And there's your half a shot. You're rarely ever getting it from one, one part of their game when they get to a high level of golf. It's, 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 it's fractional shots here and there. Saving a half a shot here, a half a shot there. So to no, speak. saving a 10th of a shot here and a 20th of a shot there. That's <laughs> the low you get, it, it all becomes fractional. Everything's fractional by the time you're high level of golf. There's no just putt better and you'll be a shot better. It doesn't happen at high level of golf. All right. So the the whole idea of using statistical tracking is to to know what to teach when. Fair enough, Brian? Yeah. No, and, it, and making sure you're being effective. Making, making sure, sure you're changing. effective, I think, is the most important part as a coach is, is I can show movement. Because sometimes score moves differently than other, other pieces might be moving. Score can remain relatively flat or do something kind of goofy but you can show here's progress but what we've got to show is over time all these pieces are moving and all the things are moving in the direction we needed to go and you know i i've actually told players to stop seeing me and go see other people because i haven't done a good enough job you know i've, I've consulted with players all around the world all different levels and and it's funny when we break their game down via game forge i've done hundreds of these not one person's ever said we were wrong they're like you nailed it. And it's just like 20 inputs and you nailed who I am kind of as my DNA as a golfer. And well, this individual who uh, plays a tour, who's in the top 10 now. Right. And um, this, you said this uh, individual had like five in positions before five birdie opportunities. It was like five, five and a half. Right. And when you shared that information with that person who was a high level college player, by the way, right. Yeah and well-known high-level college player came out with a lot of fanfare on tour and, and now is, has developed into the talent everybody thought he is. What was his reaction? Uh, the same reaction most have was that, wow, I didn't know that. I mean, I mean you're playing great level. golf. You're playing great golf, but just the hard numbers. And that's, and that's what we do differently than other programs is we're not giving you a, a strokes gain based on – a benchmark we're saying you, here's a hard number you have to hit you have to have seven opportunities so if you look at football like so i have a good friend who's an nfl player he's like you need to have the ball x number of times and x number of those times need to be inside the red zone period that's how you okay. score right that's how you score you get the ball and you get inside the red zone if you don't have the ball you're not scoring if you have the ball on your own side of the field you're not scoring right so it's a very similar thing you have, you have to have 
you at, at tour level, we know these benchmarks. This is what this is the number you've got to hit over time. Figure out what's preventing you from getting there. And then he and his coach went and dug around, and you know what? Six months later, he's hitting all his numbers. Yeah. And, Why and do you I think, think performance tracking has taken so long to to be a part of teaching instruction? Because you yeah. develop one. I'll give you my opinion because I didn't. I love data, and I never kept stats before because it was too much. So the average stats program, if you filled out everything for a round, is like five or six hundred data points. And like Brian said, you're filling out 600 data points and then you come back with it and say, well, there's just one thing I'm looking for. So it's very inefficient. You, you put a lot of effort in and not get a whole lot back. And so we just said, what's the minimum you need at different levels? So if you're shooting 95, all we need is what's your score and how many putts did you have and how many penalties? That's it. We don't need anything else. Now, how long does one, it take two, three, me done. if I, if I, I, so after my round, I can go onto, the, onto your website. I can, you know, pick, pick up my name. How long does it take me to input my round, hole one through 18? Uh, if, if you use quick stats, which is kind of, so we, we break it down into like round overview, which is quick stats, how many birdies, bogeys, how many in positions, how many P6s, kind of that. Should take you less than 90 seconds to input. And then really? we, but once you get past, once you start getting into the 70s, now you got to go into full stats. Full stats is more hole by hole, shot by shot. So that you're looking at, Spursions. I think most players tell us about three and a half, four minutes to input. So then you have a, you have somewhat of, for the higher handicap player, you have somewhat more of an, a, let's call it an elementary. Yeah, we have primary stats that's coming out. We're finishing the testing on it right now, which is kind of what Mark just said. It's going to say, what was your score? How many putts? How many penalties? And then from that, we'll figure out how many strokes it took you to get to the green. And just will really give you just very simply kind of the, the you know, an easier way into data science. Like if you just put this simple information in, we're going to be able to give you tons of information back. That's going to help you get to where you want to go. And I think again, kind of what we tried to create inside of game forge is we wanted to say, when we modeled the tour, we said, what does it take to predict score? That's basically our, our entire premise said, we want to be able to predict score. How are we going to do that? So most that's others, how you founded Game Forge on that premise. That is, of that's kind of the ethos of what prediction. we did. Where most of the stat companies are more of a reporting base, right? I put in 500 data points and it gives me 30,000 data points from those 500. It interprets it, sends it out to you. So me as a coach, what does that mean? I'm not the smartest guy, right? I'm a little slow. So cute, I'm not bro. a data scientist. So I'm looking at yeah, all this everyone. information. And that's why I'm digging out one or two things that I find important and I just go look at. But there's so much information there, but I just don't know. Or it's just not easy to acquire to get my player better. So that's, again, that's kind of the ethos of the side of Game Forge is we just want to give you the answers. We don't want you to have to sit down with a cup of coffee and in three hours through each player to figure out what you need to learn from each player. We want within 10 seconds to look at the screen to say, strengths, weaknesses, here's where I go. And, and then that's what we created. My player can input the data, but the, I don't have to have them interpret, right? They could, they could share their account with me so that, you know, I could go in and, and look at it and figure out, well, you know, you know, Brian Bailey is, you know, he's the 86 shooter. He wants to be an 80, 79 shooter. I look at all the data and here's where we're going to pick up strokes. Yeah, we have two. We have a coach's account. A coach's account can invite players in and you'd be able to look at all the players' data. And then you have a player's account where a player could do it individually, where they can create their own and look at their own system. So a lot of it is coaches' accounts where the player shares their information. And that way you can sit at one hub, big database, and look at what's happening with each player. So, right. you know, again, it's up to – and then we do some team. So if you have a big a junior elite team or something like that, we can kind of create – we have a college coaching model that we can kind of put you in as well. So there's tons of different options, a way to do it. But, yeah, most of – for People listening here, they're going to want to create a coach's account. With the coach's account, you get a free player's account for you, so you can track your own stats if you want. But but really, it, it and then from that, you invite the players in, and the coach can sit there. And inside of Game Forge, we actually have drills and assessments, and there's there's tons of information in there how to get players better. So well, again, my player first, goes in there with his data, then I can look at it, and the system itself will assess to tell me what we need to work on. It shows you strengths and weaknesses by either scoring values or benchmarks like compared to other players so yeah we give you all that information to saying this is what it takes to get to, to the next, next level. level and then i can select what i think is you know the the low-hanging fruit if you will that's for my why player. you're a coach you, you'll look at the percentages and say what percentage 
can I move them the best to help their score? I'll you show know? you. I'll show you a quick one here, John. Um, so this is a next level graph for uh, this is a current PJ Tour player. Um, broken out long game, short game, and putting. So simple green, green, uh, orange, red. So long game, everything's fine. Everything's green. So it shows his current values and his target values. So he's averaging 1.7 under par. We want to, let's say, if we want to get him to three under par, which would make him number one in the world, ball striking's fine. Uh, scrambling, there's a problem. So just looking at that, scrambling is low because his P6 is low, which means he's not hitting it inside six feet enough. And so then you go dig. Nice. So then you just go dig down and figure out what lie conditions is he is he trailing on and work on the P6. Putting is interesting because it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, his short putting, his mid range putting is good. His short putting um, for birdie is a little low. That's and inside. His long putting is a little low. Guy. Yeah, his long putting is a little low, but his three putts are really good. So that probably washes out. But his short birdie putts are not as good as his mid range birdie putts. Uh, so he has to get better point. inside eight feet. Yeah, usually that's usually that's a speed thing. Usually they get in there, you know, six, seven footer for birdie and their speed changes, meaning they jam it a little bit or I, I don't know. I don't work with them directly on that, so I don't know. But that that's kind of a red flag of, OK, well, why why are you lagging birdie conversion inside eight feet, but not nine to 20 feet? Nine to 20, even, his numbers are good. Or even All if right. you look at his P6 conversion, that's P6 is converting par, par, par saves, right, inside of six feet. He's converting at roughly 90%. We could see maybe a 10% drop from there because of seven and eight feet. Uh, so, you know, that would be in the 78. So he's definitely, there's a piece. Now, what is that piece? So why, what are we losing between one and eight opposed to one and six for par? And those are great conversations. Like if you didn't have this data, you this is not a sit down moment with your player. You just don't know. Well, you know, I they just say, think I don't you know, make enough. I don't feel like I make enough. I don't, you know, I, I feel like other players are making more, but you got to have this data to be able to, to really. Yeah. It's a, the, the feel likes don't get you anywhere. Right. No. Because maybe you're not like, you know, cause we always have, you know, we always have the student in front of us say, well, you know, I, I feel like I'm doing this really well, you know, or, you know, uh, my short game is really good. And, but you know, they're, they're, they're shooting in the mid to high nineties. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, that doesn't tell me your short game's good, does it? No. Hey, you know, and, and you're, you know, and so we know we know that that's not true. But again, I don't think I don't think students lie to you as much as I think they have a perception of their own game that might not be as accurate. Just like your high level tour player did not realize that they didn't have enough in positions, you know, inside twenty feet to compete at the PGA Tour level. Yeah. Yeah. So this so this particular player has eight. And the guy we were talking about had five and a half. That's, a, that's, you know, that's a lot. There's a big difference. That's 10 to 12 opportunities, a tournament different between the two of them. So that's 10 to 12 potential birdies. Yeah. Yep. And you only need a couple. I like, I like I always tell my, uh, you know, you look at a player that's slacking in this position and say, you know, I work with a lot of collegians. So, all right, the best player in the country is averaging eight in positions and you're averaging you know, five. So that's three per, you know, that's nine over three days. So you're saying the best player in the country and they're converting, let's say at 20%. So, you know, they're making two extra birdies per, you know, per tournament. So I'm spotting the best player in the country already two shots just off a of ball striking. So I'm already down two. best player in the country. How, how good do you feel that you're going to be the best player in the country week in, week out when you're spotting them shots just because the opportunities are there. So again, it's just understanding that concept of like, if I'm not good enough here, you can't expect weekend. I might be able to clip them in a tournament or a round, or maybe a, I get hot and I can clip them over three weeks, but over an entire season, you know, again, it goes back to that blackjack model. Blackjack's there for a reason. You, you know, there's a certain amount you can win or lose. So, you know, the, the, you can't, you can't expect, you know, I think where John, where you kind of said is the player goes back to their best. Like, like when they send you video, what they send you the best swing video of the bad videos, right? They don't send you the one where they top it and hit it six yards left. They send you the best swing and you look Never. at it. It looks pretty good. Never. That's this, this kid that sent me the video this morning, he was like, a, he, I think he, was, he said it was like an eight iron from about 140 yards and he hit it inside 12 feet. Yeah. That's right? terrible. What's wrong with my swing, right? And so, he's, and he's, <laughs> you know, and he's shooting in the mid nineties. So what do you think? I got the best shot of the round. 
Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, exactly. that's the way, you know, and I would even say me as a coach, like being a college coach is different. I, for 20 years, I watched thousands of golf holes with, with some high end players walking the golf course with them, seeing what they do shot in shot out. Like I get that feeling. Right. Well, but me as a coach, I was wrong. If I didn't have the data, right. Let's say I've been working with a player on short game. Our, our goal all winter was to get better, you know, become a better scrambler. I'm not walking with him, but I'm watching from a fairway across and I see him miss a green and I see him kind of chunk one. I'm barely on the green. I'm like, Oh God, no. Right. And then two holes later, I see him hit it way past the hole. And I'm like freaking out. Like, cause I'm seeing seg segments are happening, but I don't understand the whole picture. At the end of the day, the two shots that she didn't get up and down were the two I saw. And one of them, she, you know, she was sitting in four inches of rough. And the other one was if she hit it any further that it would have rolled off the green. So my perception was she's sucking it, right? But the real perception was she hit her number and she did what she had to do to perform. So the danger is if you don't have kind of that data background that's showing you what's happening, when it's happening and why, it gets emotional. And then we all know you don't make very good decisions when you're emotional, right? So it's just, you got to be able to strip away that emotion and be able to sit down and look at a player and say, here's where we are. Here's where we're going. Let's take the emotion out of it. This is what we have to do. How are we going to get there? Because again, like Mark said, you know, they, they look at you. How'd you put today? Terrible. Mm -hmm. What's that mean? I didn't make anything. Yeah, I, That means nothing to me at all. Yeah. Well, You're how right. can I get you better? You used to scare me. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. Yeah. Here's a lollipop. Will that make you feel better? Uh, you know? So again, it's, it's, what are these performances? Sorry. That was uncle Brian. Moment. Uh, so it's, it's just one of those, like, what can we do to get you better? And, and I think the beauty of it is the system, the one, the one feedback I've gotten from touring players to college coaches, high end players, is it gives you that language of performance. Like when you're working on the range, we're working on impositions. We're working on hitting shots within 20 feet. There's a dialogue. There's an understanding of what it takes to perform. When I'm working short game, how often can I hit P6? You know, players are talking about making bombs, impositions, conversion rates. Like it creates that language in a common language. And I think that's probably the number one feedback we've gotten from. When we first came out with our new language, we got a lot of pushback. We don't know what this means. This is not conventional. We got a lot of that. And then now we get a lot of coaches going, this gives us a, a parameter to talk and understand performance and how to kind of get where we want to go as a squad, where we're trying to achieve. And we have tour players that are like, they play in position games. They're like, my goal is to get eight in positions today. So, you know, for ADD players like myself, I need to have ways to rein my, my concentration in when I play. So I set up a sheet and I'm like, all right, my goal is to get seven in positions today. So let's go. And every time I get it, and then if I'm, my day is wearing down and I'm not hitting my in positions, I'm getting, you know, I'm challenging more and more pins because I have to reach this number to reach my scoring goal. So there's a lot of fun activities and different games you can play, understanding this language and going to attack to get the player better. I think we should ask Joe Hallett what he thinks. Joe hey, Hallett thinks a lot of different things. Joe's in the house. He right. Joe is in the house. Joe he's Hallett, the for those of you in the house. Could, yeah, Joe is, uh, he's a co-host. I don't know now. what's behind me here. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah. Very echoey, though. <laughs> so Joe Howard is a LPGA tour player coach. He works with Stacey Lewis, who is now the uh, Solheim Cup captain, which is something Joe's known for the past month, but has not told any of us. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Keep the secret. So Joe, you use, uh, you use Game Forge with your tour players. Yes. I do, and amongst other things, at the beginning of this year, and it's something that, I mean, A, it's a great tool, and it's a great resource, but the, the two gentlemen that are between us on the screen are the resource that even as a coach, when things get, you're like, what, what am I missing in the picture here? That's the greatest resource is to kind of be able to drop Brian or Mark a text and go, am I looking at the right thing? But from this year going forward, any player that I have that is that is serious about wanting to turn professional, this is this is a non-negotiable item for me. They have to have some sort of stat tracking program. And I prefer that they have this because it's going to avoid them going down rabbit holes. It's going to make their journey faster. And the proof, obviously, Mark, I mean, every, every week I am out there, I stop by and I chat with Brittany Altamari, who to me is the poster child for, for what this does for your game. She always knows where her game is at. She always knows what she's supposed to work on. She'll be the first person to tell you, I don't outdrive everybody. I don't compress the ball harder than anybody. 
I can out putt a lot of people out there, but I know the putts I need to make. And like you guys were talking about the P6s, that, that's just an amazing stat. I think, Mark, you told me once you had a, a parent that was saying something about, oh, my kid's short game is great. And you gave him like 10 of the most simple chips you could ever have, not a short side or anything. And he got one within six feet. And just knowing where that, that, that discussion starts to go, look, maybe your kid's better at really tough shots, which could be true, but boy, you're passing AKA away Phil Mickelson. normal. So uh-huh. it's, yeah. And it's, by the way, I hadn't thought of the lollipop thing, but I'm picking up a bag at CBS today. Next time I go out there. Thank <laughs> you, Bobby, Ryan Bailey. <laughs> Joe, there, Mark- there's a, there's a stat I'll, I'll share the person, but a very a LPJ player who's very, very well known for her putting. As I looked at her stats, her putting was average. Her P6 for the last 12 rounds was like 95%. Whoa. An insane number. I've never seen that before in my life. Wow. So she's making 95% six feet and in? Every, basically, every time she misses a green. She doesn't miss a whole lot of greens, but every time she misses, she's inside six feet, basically. Yeah. Which means her bogey number was tiny. Right. Like so, insane uh, so, numbers. So Joe mentioned, Brittany, what, what happened there? From the beginning? Cliff Nose version. We're going oh, to try knows, to finish before five. Knows, Brian, Brian works with Brittany, but the, the big thing with Brittany was, like Joe said, she's not the longest driver. So if you want to go out and be a top 20 player, being an average length driver, um, you've got to fill the gap somewhere else as best as you can. And she's done it very well with putting, but you know, you hit a you hit a ceiling at some point where you can't really put much better. Um, and then the only thing left is short game, is really short game proximities. Right? You just gotta hit it closer, you gotta chip it closer when you miss the green. And you then know, what about her par five that. performance? What's that? Her par five performance. Um, when, when she finished second in, cause I, this was actually a struggle because I always said, you know, your go for it's need to be a certain number. You need to be ideally two under on your par fives during the round. And she, like a lot of people kind of grew up with the layup and be safe and go to a hundred and be comfortable and make par on your par fives. And the whole point was, well, no, we need to, you know, you've got to make a ton of birdies. You're not going to get them if you play the par fives like a par four. So she played Canada a couple of years ago where she finished second. You remember that, Joe? She was second yes. in Canada. She shot, I think, 22 under and 20. She was 20 under on the par fives and 22 under overall. And there are five par fives on that course. But still, she basically made all of her scoring on the par fives. And that was the perfect example. She's like, I never thought I would shoot 22 under in my life. But amazingly, 20 of the 22 were par five birdies. Well, and, and you know, John, and, and I, was, I was listening to everything before. The one thing that that Gameforge does for me is, and the coolest thing now is to kind of be able to see the trend. It's always telling me what the lowest hanging fruit is. And from that aspect, it's many times, it's like talking to the caddy of the player. You know, you see that they struggled and you give them a text and say, hey, you know, give me a heads up. Did you see anything out there? And, you know, just from a basic standpoint, gosh, you know, they couldn't get lined up square at all today or anything, right? But sometimes you'll hear from a caddy and it'll go, they're going to complain about their eight iron, but it's not their eight iron that's killing them. It's the wedges that keep coming up 20 and 30 feet short. And it's kind of like Gameforge is that caddy in the background who goes, after you guys discuss this, bring the wedges into the conversation and, and, (laughs) and discuss that because we all know from a playing standpoint, there is something that we could hit the driver great all day. And if we absolutely block one right and hit it out of bounds, that's the topic of discussion after a competitive round. And, you know, and and it's the caddy who's there and goes, I haven't seen that shot in nine months. I'm not worried about it. It was an outlier. What I am worried about is this. And that's what, that's what, I can add to the data that I'm going to just pick up the basics, but now I can see, okay, you know what? We're not getting as many in positions. We're not getting the P6s the way we used to. And that immediately tells me, like, like Mark, you said, is, is, it a, is it a technique issue or do we just need more practice in a different variety of conditions? You know, and then, then the questions become much easier. You know, you kind of look and say, you know, Back when you played at Boca, I walked that golf course. There are not many flat lies around the green. So all of a sudden, now when you go out and practice for your P6s, you're not just chipping off a flat area. You're going to go and you're going to put the ball above your feet, below your feet, uphill, downhill. 
and you got to make sure that that technique is correct. It, it, it makes me a better instructor, which I like. It makes me look smarter, which no one believes. So <laughs> it's really good on both of those tools. Yeah, but there's some history there. there there's certain reasons why people have that belief. Now, <laughs> so Joe, what has gained? So you've been doing this a long time. You've been out on tour for, for a lot of years. You have a number of Solheim Cup players who you have instructed you know, over the years. Uh, with Stacy involved with Solheim Cup now, uh, I assume you're going to also have some kind of some kind of role going forward. What has Game Forge shown you as an instructor that you just didn't didn't really buy into or believe before? Well, I think the thing that Mark and and Brian talked about in the beginning, and it's sort of a and Brian will crack up laughing at this, but it's because when it right first again. came out. <laughs> when, when it first came out, it was, I understood it, I got it, and it made total sense. But when you go to you go to a competitor or a player or a team of a caddy and a player, and you go, I have another thing I'd like you to do after the round. You get a little bit of an eye roll, and it's like, okay, we're already writing this down, we're already doing that down, we're already doing that down. And the simplicity of this was, and, and I know I could share her name because even she would chuckle about it, uh, uh, who played the tour for 10 years, Sandra Changaja. The first time she used it, she goes, it's too complicated. It took forever to enter it. And the first question on it, what was your score? And it says in big letters in relation to par and Sandra didn't play that well that day and she wrote down 74. So the computer thought she was 74 over par which even it was having problems finding a, a good area in any of that. <laughs> but in the beginning it was, oh, it's something extra for us to do. Oh, it's something extra for us to study. Oh, it's something extra that we have to sit down that takes away from time on the tee. The input as Brian and Mark have said is 90 seconds is if you're writing it in cursive with a fountain, you know, a fountain pen getting it perfect. It's, it is so simple, it is so easy to input and then most of the onus can go on the coach where you really, in a way, it's, it's a track man of stats where you go, don't look at that machine. Let me look at the machine and let's have a conversation. And that gets to be the easy stuff as, you know, what do you say we practice putts over 30 feet? Wouldn't it be fun to make some of those? And then you hear the player go, God, I haven't made a bomb in ages. Here we go. Now we're, you know, all it is for, for our job as the instructor is, can you kind of create that little motivation in them to go, all right, make up a game. And God bless you, Mark and Brian, I don't have to make up a game. I just kind of scroll through the, the 1,200 plus games and drills you got and go, here's a couple. Let's see what we can do. I think uh, Sandra was a cool story because Joe called me to talk to her one day. We we're walking oh, through stats. Yes. And she was not putting well, uh, but technique wise was really good, but wasn't putting well. And I was like, well, in, in Game Forge, we, we, do something called bip rate bip rate means birdies to end positions how often do you birdie every time you hit it within 20 feet on tour it's about a 60 percent make rate collegian you're in the upper 40s and she was putting like a collegian but she's trying to play professional and i'm like we've got to get you making more than 50 percent can't can't not be under this number and she was like that's too high it's too high da, da, da. and to her credit she didn't do any technique work all she did is said all right i'm gonna drop 10 balls between basically three feet and 20 feet. And my goal is to make six. And she struggled for about a week and then finally figured it out. And then I think she won two or three in a row and her BIP rate was above 60%. So to me, it's like the four minute mile, right? Nobody could beat it until they did. And then once they understood what was achievable, people beat it, right? Well, putting's the same way. If, if you think your standard is good, you think you're a good putter and you're hitting a certain number, you're not going to push yourself to that next level what does that look like so just by rearranging her goal and setting a new goal forced her out of her comfort zone made her perform better and then like i said she went and won a couple of events on the egglands tour or whatever the one of the many tours leading into the lpga but again it's just that concept if you don't know you just don't know and i a lot of us as coaches and i'll be honest four or five years ago i didn't know i, <laughs> I was know. guilty and, we, and we've had a number of tour players push back on how many putts they need to make European tour, PJ tour, they're like, nah, that's too high. And you go, okay, well, let's, let's have a look. Let me show you what winners are doing. Let me show you what top tenants are doing every single week. They're hitting these numbers and people are like, shit. 
<laughs> you know, you want to be out there. This is what they're doing out there. And in the chat, Michael I gave you the in the chat, I gave you the make percentage. So the average tour player from nine to twenty feet is making thirty percent. So they're making three out of ten putts between nine and twenty feet. The average collegians are a little over twenty. So again, that shows you kind of that 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 gradual step. So a junior is about fifteen to twenty. You know, a higher handicap is getting under ten percent. So again, this is showing you that progress. So for those that are coaching future collegians, aspiring professionals. It's not too early to say our goal, you know, we're in the seventies. Now our goal is we've got to get to 30%. Let's come up with a way to do that. Um, inside of game forge as well. We have assessments that for putting that basically tracks, gives you feedback on that. It starts to tell you long, short, left, right, misses, whatever gives you that data. Again, just more information to provide that. But again, these are our goals. This is what we have to, if our goal is to play professionally, we've got to get to 30% on average or be a little bit better at ball striking or something crazy, but we have to do this. So what is our plan to get there? And well, again, this is I, a great I conversation. Piece really good that. there, Brian, is like, if I'm a mid seventies to 80 shooter, right. And I'm out there at 10 feet and I'm making one out of four putts. I'm doing what that, that range should do. I think the expectation of the player sometimes is way beyond what the, the realistic fact is, right. You always have to ask them. Uh, you know, every player, my goal as a coach is my player needs to be informed. So uh, when we're at a certain zone, I'm like, what should you be making here? What's your goal? I don't know. Well, if you don't know, then we've hit it. Here's a lollipop. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right. We've got to know we what our goal Let's go have a beer. Is. Yeah, let's go have a beer. It'll be just as much accomplished over that beer if we actually talk these numbers right? and we actually get goal. on this putting green. But, but again, they've got to understand what's good and what's not. You know, they've got to say, my average is 30%, which means in a drill, I'm going to do 20 one time. And I'm going to do 40 the next time. My average is 30. I've got to understand what I do and how it gets done. And then I got to set my goals to reach that next level. And again, a lot of touring professionals don't do it because they just don't know. You know, a lot of us coaches don't know. And, and it just kind of, you know, works the way back. The worst thing you can do is listen to a lot of the guys on the television during a round because they just talk nonsense. But again, you've got to, you've got to say, these are your expectations. And, and again, what are we trying to achieve? Again, Mark, talk about you can be a have a player that just wants to talk on the range with you, wants to just chat it up, you know, just kind of that kind of golfer. Game Forge is not for them, you know, chat them up, have a good time. But if you have a player that wants to perform, wants to compete, wants to get better, and more so wants to win at whatever level they're at, <coughs> we can show you how to do it. Well, the thing is, like at 10 feet, a person who's shooting in the 80s is making one out of five putts. That's what they do. Yeah. Right. And so if they're complaining about that. There's really no complaint. That's what somebody at your ability level does. And I think helping helping players set realistic expectations is, is what it's all about. Right. Because yeah. most of the people that I see who who want to improve, they're always denigrating their games. Right? There's a, there's a lot of self abuse. Right. And when it gets really bad, sometimes I'll start beating them up. Right. They'll hit shots and I'll say, could you hit it any worse? And I'll, I'll do this for three, four, five, six shots. And finally, they look at me and they said, are you enjoying yourself? And I said, well, that's what I hear you doing all the time. That's what you sound like to yourself. Oh, I bet you it was worse. Oh, yeah. you know, and, and it's <laughs> you just know. like, that's, you know, so they're always beating themselves up over, even though they're, you know, as, a, as an 80 shooter, I should only make one out of, you know, five at 10 feet. So I think that's really important for them to understand. That's what that ability level does. Because I think I the expectations yeah. across, and you probably see it with tour players, Joe and Brian and Mark, you probably see it with tour players, right? The expectation level is, is much different than the reality. No, yeah, every, every practice session I'm in, my players have assessments. We're doing it. Here's an assessment. Let's, how many putts are we going to make here? What's our goal? I had a text message yesterday. I have a lesson from a player out of state coming in and she shared with me her last couple practice sessions. And she goes, I'm putting like a collegian, but I still not where I need to go in tour. She's 13. <laughs> like, she's like, I'm already, I'm already collegiate level. I got that. My goal is to play like, so she's like, I'm making this many putts. I'm, I'm a good collegian right now. Again, her goal is tour. She understands it. So inside of training, everything she does, she understands what's, what she has to do. And that's the player I love to work with because now it's fun. Now we can start moving pieces and get them to where they want to go. Uh, you know, it's much for a coach. I'm much more satisfied.
Does it surprise any of you how long it takes for somebody to become a good putter? I think Some the people are quicker ones. than others. <laughs> What's yeah. That? I, Some people are quicker I, than others. Some people, it's, it's a light switch. They're, they've got good speed and motion. You just give them a good read and it's game over. And others, you got to piece together a few more pieces than that. You know, you know, and, and Mark, and I know you and Brian know this too, as well as you, John, but it's kind of sometimes if you can describe to a highly competitive player who's, you know, it's kind of like, okay, even you're watching as a coach and you're going, they're putting awful, which, you know, cannot come out of your mouth at any point, but it's kind of be like, let's work oh. on this length putt. But you literally go from missing speed wise long and short to kind of getting it around the hole you know and it's kind of it's this little journey where your second putt is a longer way away we're improving your second putt is now a tap in and then they get to that dreaded area where they're like i'm not making anything everything lips out on me we're on the journey to a better putter and that's when having the facts behind it help you really highlight and go let's not miss any of these putts on the low side and see what happens let's let's work in that uh, Brian, like you and Mark were sharing, let's really work in that four to seven foot area so that when you hit it there for birdie, you don't take it for granted. You put the same effort and the same role on it you do with a par putt. And I mean, it, it, some players just don't even understand what that journey looks like. They just assume they're going to go from being a bad putter to making everything. And it doesn't work that way. Not, not that I've ever seen. I don't know about you guys. Make no. percentages climb much slower than technique. You know, and the other thing that's beautiful about Game Forge, especially in the putting aspect, is I, I had the, <laughs> it's kind of like you can start out nice, then you can kind of hit to the facts. And John, like you, it's like, okay, now I'm going to belittle you as bad as you belittle. And by the way, now let's look at the absolute data and see how pathetic it really is. <laughs> that, that's, that's maybe a softer journey. And, and I had a chance to ask Jackie Burke once if it was a true story as I sat in the putting green outside of the pro shop. And he said, the one with Billy Ray Brown. And I said, yes. And apparently he had watched Billy Ray Brown go out and just lacklusterly hit some five foot putts. And he was making about half of them. And Jackie walked out and said, young man, give me your putter. And then he open handed him and slapped him in the face. And it said, it should hurt when you miss a five footer and went right back into the pro shop. Oh and he said God. his make percentage went up and he put a little more care into each one of those. <laughs> so somewhere between that and a soft journey. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's Jackie Burke. Huh? Hey, there's certain things. Brian's we just don't working practice his way anymore. towards that. Also. I'm slowly getting there. Brian yeah, will be yeah. there pretty soon. He's going to send me out a lollipop one day. Brian's <laughs> giving lollipops out, right? <laughs> yeah. So, Joe, would you say as a as a tour coach and you teach high level collegians, you're down there at the Legends at Vanderbilt. So, you know, you see all the, the college players there. Right. That's their home for the, the men and ladies teams that uh, the Game Forge gives you. It kind of gives you a framework from which to work from. So yes. you're not and guessing you anymore. Yeah. And you definitely know what's walking up to you on the practice tee from the things that you couldn't see if you weren't able to see them play or you're not able to see them practice. And it's factual you know, data. That's, that's huge to kind of go, all right, what would his miss be on the course based on what's happening on the practice tee? That's gigantic for an instructor. And then you can access your players accounts as a coach. Yes. So they can. And I can adjust how many drills you know, and there's some like, well, there's so many. And finally, I think I'm trying to convince Brian to put down a once a month button just to get him to do something. <laughs> we could do that. And then Mark, talk about how, uh, how does one use Game Forge? Subscription-based? Yeah, subscription-based. Um, it's uh, $9.99 a month or $99 a year. Um, and then you have a 30 day trial period for some 30 day wants trial. To try you can go there and do all you want for 30 days. Uh, there's a iOS app. So it's, it's easier to put the um, scores in uh, through the app. Uh, so I highly recommend everybody who's entering scores use that. But it's also got drills and assessments in the app as well, which are cool. And um, you can also go onto the website if you're on a laptop at home at night or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can do the website also if you want. Yeah. And what know. I thought was kind of cool was like, because, you know, we're not in play mode up here. Um, but I could go in right now and I could, I was talking to Brian about this. I could put in, you know, rounds of golf that, you know, I, 
I could just kind of make bogus rounds of golf and, and get an idea of what I need to do. Like if I put in a round that shoots 85, that's going to tell, that'll tell me more about my 85 player. Or if I put in a round of golf, that's 90, or if I put a round of golf and it's 74, you know, and, and so I could, I can get different ideas about what those people need. And so I can plan for my season as well. Yeah, there's also benchmarks in there for all those different um, scoring levels, which um, I can show you where to find them if you want. Um, but yeah, you can go in there and say, depending on my player's scoring level, uh, what type of player they are, it'll, it'll tell you pretty clearly what each one of their benchmarks are. Well, I think the benchmarks would be really helpful in designing, you know, the program for yeah. for the members going forward, right? You know, you have the people, your members that come out to work through the season, they're starting their season. So, you know, you, you get a number of scores in there. When do you when do you feel the data gets legitimate? How many rounds of golf do you need in there to 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 trust the data? Because you're gonna obviously you're gonna have the guy who goes out and has that you know 74, but that's a that's a weird round. Yeah, I mean, we like to see 10. We'll start eight to looking 10. at it six or eight, but we really want to see 10 rounds. 10 rounds, and you're you're getting because that's gonna the outliers are gonna get washed out. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, one one or two rounds is definitely not enough. But people go put past rounds in if they remember them. Mm -hmm. We do that a lot with players. We'll grab old data and just preload it with their old data so they, they know where they're starting. Right. And Mark, from a standpoint of, you know, you developed Aimpoint, you know, because you can write software. How have you used, uh, how have you worked with the Aimpoint in the Game Forge arena? Uh, well, 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 we can see sometimes pretty obviously from the game forge numbers is depending on somebody's putting conversion profile a lot of times. And we can also see speed control and proximities and things like that. A lot of times you can tell when it's, when it's a speed problem versus a read problem. Like if you see people with good proximity, good speed, and they're just not making anything, it's probably a, a read problem. Right. And then we can, we've had players we've tracked pre aim point and then they've learned aim point and post aim point. So there was a, um, Pro, the one guy we were talking about earlier, and then some European tour players who started Aimpoint while they were using it. And we can very, very clearly see the difference in make percentage, which converts into the difference in scoring, which converts to the difference in money, right? But the whole idea is, are you better for using Aimpoint or not? And the, and the answer was a very, very resounding yes. Um, but there's ways that, you know, putting is obviously not just read, but it's a big component of it. And you can have the best motion in the world and, and the best speed in the world, which nobody does, but you have the perfect motion and make nothing if your reads are bad. If your reads are even okay, you're not going to make nearly what you need to make. And you've been doing a lot of, uh, a lot of consulting with both players and caddies off of the, the PGA and the LPGA tour recently, have you, with the green books being banned? Yeah, more than ever in my life, the last three, four months, I'd say. Now, we were talking the other night about uh, a previous PGA championship winner who that you were working with. And um, what would you say in, in working with a player at that high level, what surprised you about their perceptions of their putting? Um, what surprises me even at that level that some of their concepts are bad. Um, not necessarily motion comp concepts, how to move the putter, but just green reading concepts. Some of them are just flat wrong about some of their concepts, just, just wrong. You know what I mean? And, and if your concepts are bad, it's hard to get past that. So we, you know, our, you know, our model is you got to start with good concepts. Um, then process is next. Is your process good? And then it gets into motion and, and things like that. But so we, we, I spend more time than you would think just cleaning up concepts on things like grain, double breaks, um, what the ball does, kind of four to six feet, how the break changes. Like a lot of people just don't know. They just flat don't know. Even at a very high level of golf, they just don't know. And there's probably no reason they would, though, right? They've never been well, trained with it. You would think. Well, no, but I mean, uh, it always it like usually at a high level, at, you know, at tour levels, usually their strokes are pretty darn good. Like there's they have little biases here and there, but it's not a stroke problem by the time you get to PJ Tour, you know. And they all blame their stroke, and it's usually not a stroke problem. It's usually a read problem and a speed problem. And and once their read's good, it's almost always a speed problem at that point. It's always just and, didn't match speed up. And we have a number, number of competitive players sitting in the, on the call this morning. Um, and I spent time with you and Brian and, and Joe a few weeks ago when we were in Orlando. Talk to, talk to us about that four to six foot range, which are 
or basic your cleanup bird or your cleanup birdie oh, yeah. putts or your your really good chips for par, right? Yeah. So what people don't understand there is you know the make percentages across the board tank between four and six feet. Like on PJ Tour, it's ninety percent from four feet, and then by the time you get to six feet, it drops to like well, by the time you get to five feet, it's one in five. Well, three feet is. 98%, five feet is 80%. So they go from missing one in 50 to missing one in five in a two foot window, right? And what's happening kind of three, four, five, six, seven feet is the break is expanding very quickly, meaning it's growing very fast. So if, so the demonstration I always give is you, you take a kind of an average little four foot putt, read it, hit it right in the middle, back up one foot, try to play the same break at the same speed. And half the time it's going to lip out low, go back one more foot and you miss the hole. So in, in that little two foot window, the break is growing enough that if you keep trying to play the same break, you're, you're missing and you're missing badly. And so you have to understand how fast is that rate breaking? How important is the length of the putt? If you don't know you're at six feet versus five feet, you, you could be misreading a lot of putts just because you're not aware of it. So just the fact that you know what a four foot putt is, a five foot putt, the six foot putt versus a three foot putt, right? That makes a yeah, big difference. Really four to six, four to six is really the magic the magic range because that's the cleanups so like well we talked about p6 earlier you don't have a whole lot of, i mean when you miss the green your par save is usually not inside three feet <laughs> it's usually right. four to six first and seven to 12 next you know it's right. not the little baby tap-ins it's that's not where we are and and you know one of the best putters <laughs> i've ever worked with every lesson we spent 20 to 25 minutes four to six feet only and she won many 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 tournaments um because she would never give up shot at six feet in for par she was making them all day long and other players were missing and that just that just gave her such a huge advantage because she so clearly understood it one of the uh who i think is one of the best putters on tour right now is xander Shoffley, right and his percentage of make was like inside 10 feet he was 90 percent for the year and that's just a just, just it, that just blows me away that somebody could be that good at that point. That's, you know, a, lot. Inside, <laughs> that's a lot. That's well, a lot. I mean, yeah. I, I don't mean, even know what just, to say about that. That's a lot. <laughs> that's crushed a category, right? Oh yeah, that's a category kill. Now they they rarely do that two years in a row. To be fair, um, I might be wrong about him, but like I know, you know, even the year Spieth was like insanely high from outside twenty feet. Um. He didn't do it the following year. And like why do you think ago. somebody might be, why do you think somebody is good from 10 to 20 feet, but not good from four to 10 feet? Any particular reason, um, anything you see for, with the better players you work with? A uh, couple things. They just don't understand what's going on inside four, five, six feet. They change their speed up. So they have different speeds for short putts than, than longer putts, which is a problem. Um, and a lot of, a lot of players like seeing more break or less break. So when they get farther out, they like the look of a big breaking putt and they don't, they're not comfortable on the straighter, shorter putts and some it's vice versa. Some it's the opposite. So if you, if you grew up with steep greens, you like, you like seeing a lot of break. If you grow up on flat greens, you like seeing a very small amount of break. And so there's ranges there they prefer, but a lot of times I see it's, it's the shorter ones. They just try to play them too straight and too hard and it just doesn't work. <laughs> You know, uh, one of our one of our friends there, Dr. Farnsworth, is working with uh, DJ, right? And I was listening to some stuff that DJ was, was was sharing, and and he said on his straight putts, he likes to use the line on the ball because he likes to see break. He yeah, said, most That's of just players a, don't like straight putts, in my experience. They, they yeah, always he, he says he's uncomfortable with it. That's the only time he uses the line on his ball because. He has to see it as straight because he keeps wanting to add break to it. Yeah. You know? I, I've seen that a lot from better players. They, they're very uncomfortable accepting that it could actually be straight. There's not a whole lot of straight putts outside six or seven feet, to be honest, but there are some. Right. And I would say higher handicaps that struggle short versus long. I think a lot of that is they have a technique piece that's wrong. So on a short putt, there's, it's happening in such a short area and a short time frame that there's not a lot of wiggle room. But on a longer putt, they have a chance to maybe, with the length of putt, they can override the face and they do some goofy stuff to try to, like, bring, a, bring it back into 
you know, a, a reasonable launch launch condition. So I think a lot of times for a higher handicap, I think the the length, the time that they have to move the putter is actually a benefit where shorter putts, they tend to get really short, really jabby, really fast. Yeah. And the longer putts, that gives them more time to to do what they need to do to get the putter back on the ball pretty well. So, you know, so that would be, and again, the beauty of this is when you see the numbers, this is where you get to be a coach, right? Why is this happening? I know we're underperforming what's happening and where can I provide my value to get them better? And, right. and I think that's the beauty of all this. Um, and coaching wise, one thing we can give you, if your player is using full stats in the system, we do a, a strikeout or by distance bends, what they're hitting. And we show you on average, this is what we would expect them to hit at 20 feet and in, what their impositions are. And what I've come to find out how I've helped more play, and I don't do long game, but how I've improved more long players better, just by saying, what are the five shots you have the most? And are you hitting your number? You know, at, at 130 yards, 50% of your shots should be 20 feet and in. Are you hitting that number? If that's a shot you have a lot, are 50, and if not, we need to train and get that better, right? So like I said, it, it, it so we call that kind of the core five. Like here are the five shots you have the most. 70% of all your shots on the golf course come from this distance. You better be daggone good here because if not, you're giving away shots. And that's really where we see a lot of times with tour players and more so collegians, there's zones where they are way below. They have a, a huge density and they're way under. And that's where we're missing those impositions. That's where that's where you as a coach can provide value instantaneously and say, from 130 to four, what is that? Is it a gap in equipment? You know, is, did your wedge get bent? Like, wh why is this not a, something that we can accomplish? So again, I think the beauty of the system is it just, again, you can highlight and give them a very specific, go work on this, go work on these zones. Here's the numbers and then watch how that moves all the other pieces. So that's a great for all you long swing guys, figure out the five shots that they have the most, or even look at the next tournament they're going to play and say, these are the five shots you're probably going to have the most. Maybe this is what we need to work on going in the next event instead of let's just hit a bunch of six irons. Well, that might help you, but I might only hit one six iron this next tournament. All right. So we've, we've got to start making this smart evaluations on what can we do to move players. And again, it's just going back and understanding offense, defense. I got to make birdie. What does that look like? Defense. What does that look like? And train and get prepared to what you're getting ready to go see. If you do that, you become a performance coach at that point, right? You're, you're preparing them to perform for their next event opposed to let's work on, can we hit up on this ball? Let's work on ground motion. Let's work on angle of attack, all pieces that are, that matter. But when you're really talking about performance, it's, it's more than just that. So if you want we, to start taking that step, we, we give you, we give you every Avenue to get there. Well, the thing is you, you give us all the stats and then we can interpret the stats as we want to. But every one of us is going to be involved, like like Joe, you know, with with good players as well as you know developing players and and even new players. We've got to know how to become a performance coach, right? Because, like you said in the beginning, they came to us because they wanted to be better at something, right? And and it's not about how well they practice; it's how well they perform. If you uh, if you look at any of the or see any of the interactions between Rick Sessinghouse and Colin Mawakara, I mean, they they hardly ever, ever spent any time in the range. It was always on the golf course and it was always there was always interaction of, you know, here's a shot I don't have or how do I get better at this shot? And for those of us that might spend more time on the tee, everything that GameForge brings is is that and that's how someone like Rick becomes such a great performance coach because not only does he probably have the data, he sees it face on over and over and over again. And for us to be able to see when we're not there, what's happening out there. And at least, you know, the easiest way to say it is it's, you know, it's either green for good or red for bad or orange to me means, you know, let's just make sure we're moving in the right direction when we start looking at a fast breakdown. But if they come to us with a request and we can help them hit that ball better or further, the next piece is logical because if we teach them to hit it further and they don't know how to perform, they're going to hit over about four greens and there is nothing good anywhere in the universe on the backside of a green. <laughs> they're going to make doubles rather than pars and bogeys. And it's literally, so being able to take whatever technical and then add that piece to go, 
here's what's going to happen. Let's be prepared for it and let's practice for it. Now, Joe, should we uh, should we ask for our pictures and your autograph now before Solheim Cup? Uh, yes, because it'll be less expensive. They're still free. <laughs> They're still free. <laughs> uh, right, right, right now, I'm 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 lobbying to be the head cart driver for one of the assistant captains. That's about my role. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I think put, the, put that. me on the list for that also. <laughs> I want to where's the Solheim Cup going to be, Joe? The Solheim Cup will be in Spain. It's actually a new venue. And uh, as you can imagine, for those of you that may know a little bit about Stacey Lewis, she is a very organized person. And uh, that's part of the thing that she's really going to bring to the team as an organization so that you know, there's nothing that pops up accidentally like, oh, we weren't prepared for that. And in the background, she and I, obviously, as Mark and Brian know, have, have kind of watched her game over the past couple of years and used GameForge. And I know there's a thing that you all haven't even touched on. But, you know, when you start talking about college coaches and teams and maybe seeing not only how can my team operate, but how can they operate cohesively together? How do we know what player is really trending on long on hitting bombs? How do we know what player is really hitting their P6s? I mean, this type of information is, you know, it's great to understand the, the psyche and the personality makeups, but to, to have that little pinch of, hey, here's what's also going on in their game, that could be a big advantage. And Joe, I'm not, not lobbying or anything, but we have some phenomenal behind the scenes stuff we do with college players on predicting match play, best matchups. Just say it. Just saying, you you might hey, want to call us. Out there too. Uh, just saying. <laughs> Mat matchups, matchups are huge and things like this. Yeah, just we matchups. got some really cool stuff yeah. behind the scenes we've been doing for a couple of years now. That makes That's a cool. lot of sense, right? Like, where where somebody? How does how do the strengths and weaknesses match up? Yep. Well, this has been great. Now, for anybody that wants to contact Mark or Brian with relative, you know, to GameForge, it's mygameforge.com is the website. And then the emails are pretty simple. It's either Brian or Mark at mygameforge.com. All right. She Joe right Howitt's Brian, out of this world. Brian so will he's, reply much he's... faster than Mark. <laughs> if you'll just send it to inmate number 751 at the Folsom <laughs> County Prison. And say it. It's much faster return of email. <laughs> <laughs> this has been great, guys. We really appreciate your time, your input. I look forward to, to using GameForge with my students this season. And Brian, I'll be in touch with questions. And okay. I can't thank you enough for coming on today. Joe, always good to see your smiling face wherever you are. <laughs> John, Mark, Brian, thanks oh, as always. Man.